Okay, so hi everyone, welcome to uh, our first uh, non-circuit breaker edition of uh, SG STEM Talk and Trivia. I am Marcus, and my co-host is Kanan. Hello everyone, nice to yes. see everyone here. Today, uh, we are extremely lucky to have a uh, STEM practitioner, uh, Straits Times journalist as well as executive uh, photojournalist, um, get to talk to us more about how uh, a science story is reported. So brief back background about our uh, speakers. Um, Mark is a ST executive photojournalist whose work has taken him uh, all over the world from the Middle East and I heard that he was supposed to cover this year's uh, Tokyo Olympics. So it's a really exciting job. So they don't only tell a story through words but through pictures as well. Um, for Audrey, she is um, uh, science as well as uh, environment correspondent whose work has taken her to um, many poles from the recent trip to the Antarctic and the South Poles uh, to Poland, which is uh, many poles as well. So um, without further ado, I'll let them tell more about, share more about their work, about how the science story is reported as well as um, maybe they might be able to give us tips about how to communicate science better. So over to you guys, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Marcus and Kanan, and thanks for organizing this and for inviting Mark and I um, for your great initiative. So, hi everyone, thanks for joining us on a hi. Thursday evening. Yeah, um, so Mark and I, we are not scientists, okay? Disclaimer out front, we are not scientists. But over the course of our work, we have interviewed and photographed many scientists, including many of you guys in the audience today. I see a lot of familiar names. So um, today we're going to share about our experience uh, covering scientific issues and specifically we're going to talk about one particular project with a very heavy scientific focus which we embarked on last year. In fact, it's almost uh, one year exactly since our story on El Nino, a climate phenomenon was published, was published last year on June 9th. So a bit of background about how this idea came about. So. El Nino is a climate phenomenon and, I'm think, and I think many of us would be very familiar with it because of the haze crisis in 2015. So El Nino is a natural event and in Southeast Asia it causes the weather to be hotter and drier than usual. So um, it started out when I was, okay so the idea started when I was doing my master's degree at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego. So I was doing my master's in climate science and policy. So for our capstone project which is like our fi final project before we graduate we had to do a project on the intersection between science and policy. So as a journalist, of course, um, my interest is in communicating climate change. And based on my experience on, in this, um, before I, I left for my studies, I felt that it was, it was actually a, quite a difficult topic to communicate. And specifically because uh, many projections, many scientific projections on climate change are for, for very far into the future. So sea level rise is a hot topic in Singapore now. And the projections for sea level rise is like one meter by 2100. I mean, that was the findings from the latest climate change study done by our Singapore scientists. And even then, 2100, I mean, how many of us will still be alive by then, right? So it was, it was kind of challenging to communicate such a topic with such long horizons. So I decided to look at how this can be better communicated <clears throat> for my capstone project. And over the course of my studies, I, I mean, we had coursework and everything, and I found that El Nino as a natural climate phenomenon, it has impacts that are very similar to what things uh, would be like for long-term climate change. Yeah, so um, that was when I decided to focus on El Nino. And then I contacted Mark for, for this project because he had also experienced reporting on climate change issues in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, with our climate change editor, David Fogarty. And I like his work, so we decided to collaborate on this project. So um, before we go into detail about you know what our project is about, I just want to explain a bit about like the scientific basis of El Nino because we have a very cool graphic, even though I'm sure many of you would already know how El Nino works. So um, Singapore sits on the western end of the Pacific Ocean, which is the world's largest ocean basin out of the five. And uh, on under regular conditions, we would have a warm pool of water always concentrated around the maritime continent uh, due to a variety of factors, including how the trade winds blow across the Pacific Ocean and causes all the warm water to pool around our continent, which fuels the formation of rain clouds and which is why typically we get lots of rain in this region. But during an El Nino event, 
the water moves east. So it moves to Central Pacific. It has a special name called the Modoki El Nino. And it move, moves all the way to the Eastern Pacific where the Galapagos Islands and, and Peru, you know, and all the rich fisheries of South America are located. It could have very drastic impacts because uh, chiefly because the rainfall patterns change. So you, you have the warm water moving and the rain clouds move with it. So in, a, in the Western Pacific where we are, during El Nino, we get hotter, drier weather. And in places like Galapagos Islands during a strong El Nino, they get too much rain. So that is, in a nutshell, how, uh, how El Nino works. And this is just a static version of that graphic. So I thought that to tell this story, it would be interesting to document the seesaw impacts that it has. Uh, which is why for my project, I decided uh, to focus on two particular archipelagos across the Pacific Ocean, which was Indonesia and Galapagos Islands. And the impacts of one climate event has two totally different impacts um, on these two places. So I'm just going to go into detail about, you know, how we tell this scientific story because, I mean, El Nino is a coupled ocean atmospheric phenomenon. And so we knew that we had to look at the de look what happens underwater as well as on land. And coincidentally, it's World Oceans Day next week. So hence my wallpaper, which was taken in the Galapagos Islands by Mark. But yeah, anyway, so um, yeah, so step one for telling a scientific story would, of course, be preparation. And Mark and I, we tell stories through different mediums. So the ways we each of us prepare is different. So but I'm going to let him start first. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming today. Um, so usually before we start any kind of story, um, the preparation is the most important thing. And I mean prepare, I mean like logistics and what to expect from the story. So I mean, as journalists, I think the number one thing we always want to um, include first is the context. So when, when Audrey contacted me about the project, um, we knew that we were going to go to uh, faraway places or maybe remote places. So, and we were only working on uh, a tight budget. So um, one thing we had to discuss beforehand was uh, what kind of equipment we wanted to bring and what kind of shots we wanted to get. So for example, this is my packing list for the Galapagos Islands, which is slightly different from the one that I brought to Indonesia. Um, where I brought a drone, um, but when it came to the Galapagos, you know, we knew that we were going to be shooting from afar a lot, shooting animals. We, we knew that we were going to go into water and, you know, have to submerge our cameras, but we didn't have the, or rather, I didn't have the budget to buy um, something which could house my, my digital cameras. So in this case, we, we learned how to work with a uh, budget. Lah. So like, if you can see on the screen, there's this dome-like thing in the middle. That's a $15 dome from, from uh, Lazada, which I used to house my GoPro. And, and you know, it may, you, we, we managed to get pictures like this in the Galapagos with a uh, $15 housing. Stuff like this as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, going back to the list, it's like we, we also knew that in order to take our life, we needed to be you know, have the proper lenses and all that, but we don't have the same setup as what National Geo, National Geo or the New York Times has. So, in this case, I didn't even choose to bring a tripod. So, in the end, like for, in this case, uh, the blue photo booby photo, which was taken maybe 50 meters away, I used Audrey as a tripod that you see in this picture. Yeah, so she was my tripod for, for many, many different shots throughout the whole trip. Um, Talking about context again, so when we in Indonesia, we wanted to get a, like we were going to the damaged peatlands um, in Riau and we wanted to get a big picture, a, literally a big picture of what the landscape looked like when it was charred. So we, we could have done that from the ground, but it would have looked more uh, in proportion from above. So we brought a drone. I mean, of course, we researched the drone laws and all that, which is all part of the preparation and logistics. And we managed to get stuff like this. And then we went to Java. We also went to visit a, a reforestation project. Yeah, so this is just like um, preparation before the trip. Most important thing, you know, you don't want to go there and realize that you you don't have something or even once you brought something which you don't need and then you're lugging it around. Yeah. Uh, so um, one... one of the reasons why we could get such shots of the of the vegetation was because also of research like El Nino is a natural climate event but 
human, the way humans um, behave, like in terms of how they treat their land was very important, especially for a country like Indonesia, which is why it's important to show like landscapes, hence the need for drones. So um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, this project started out when I was doing my master's. So I had a lot of access to scientific papers and scientific um, experts who study ocean atmosphere interactions. So they were a great resource, but because I knew that I was going to tell this story um, for the layman, well, for people with not so much uh, experience um, with technical topics like El Nino and like uh, thermocline and like things, uh, things like that, or El Nino 3.4, I had to find ways to tell the story in a way that's also compelling. So for my research, I also went into how other mainstream media has told the story of El Nino. So personally, I covered the Hayes episode in 2015. And even then, when I went to read my old articles, it was very cursory mention of like, you know, what the impacts of El Nino was for Southeast Asia and very little impacts about how exactly it works. In fact, most of the lines in my story is like, oh, El Nino just causes hotter and drier weather in this region. And yeah, I mean, I could go into that into detail, like why we can't always explain everything in one particular story. So anyway, while I was doing my research, uh, my advisor, Dr. Xia Shangping from Scripps, he told me that um, one of the first mainstream media coverage of El Nino was in this National Geographic uh, um, edition in 1984. So thanks to Amazon, I managed to get hold of a copy of it. And the reason why is also there are three main big El Nino events that has happened over the past five decades. So one was 1982, 1983, 19 1997, 1998, and the most recent one of 2015, 2016. So by going all the way back, we could see how the story was told. And in fact, El National Geographic in this feature, they went very in-depth into the coverage of El Nino and its impacts and how it has like teleconnections or how El Nino, even though it happens entered mainly around the Pacific Ocean, it could have impacts on other continents like Africa. So it was a very in-depth piece and I think it took like months or years of research. But it was a good starting point for me to see, you know, how how other mainstream media has told uh, the story of El Nino. So now once we had all like the scientific um, basis in place, the next thing we had to find was interviewees, right? We, which, is, which is why I'm going to explain later why sometimes um, scientists like yourself may think that journalists ask you stupid questions, but it may not, it's, sometimes it's like we know, we know um, what we're asking you, but we cannot quote ourselves, you know, like who's going to trust the Straits Times talking about a scientific topic, which they probably didn't study, which is why sometimes we need um, the scientists to explain in their terms, like their own research and the significance of what it means. So we needed to find voices with expertise, which, which is the scientists, and we also needed voices with experience. So this is how I thought um, I could make a topic like El Nino more relatable to the layman, which is um, to actually show the impacts of a climate phenomenon on human lives and livelihoods in biodiversity so that was where um, we had to do a lot of research. In fact, I think this was one of the hardest parts of the feature because Mark and I, we, when we are at the Straits Times, we are in the Singapore desk, right? We, we work mainly in Singapore. So we had to really stretch um, contact, our contacts all across the world uh, and try to leverage contacts with the NGOs who work in, in different places. And in the Galapagos Islands, we had to hire a fixer. So I'm not sure whether you guys know what Pixar is. It's, it's journalism jargon for uh, when you hire someone who works in a particular, particular area and you hire them to bring you around and to introduce you to, to people and stuff. So um, we're going to show you some pictures of the personalities that we met uh, in Indonesia first. So this is an Indonesian journalist whose name is Muklis. And he actually lost his son during El Nino in 2015. Uh, due to respiratory diseases, uh, due to a respiratory disease that his son had and difficulty breathing because the haze there was so thick. Uh, if you guys remember in Singapore, the haze, the air quality here was also very bad. But in Riau, which is where we were, it, you can't imagine like on ground zero, it, things are really so much worse. And I guess that's one, one good, on um, one, one thing about being a journalist is that, you know, people trust you with their stories and they share such intimate details with you and you want to do them justice, you know, not, we're not sensationalists or, or what, but we try our best to try to convey their stories and the impacts that, you know, things like El Nino, natural climate change and all that has on, on people and families. So, um, yeah, 
Nucleus was one, and we also met um, a coconut farmer. So, um, yeah, Muis, we met him in Bangladesh Regency. So, can you imagine from Pekan Baru, where we met Muklis, to this place, it took us more than 10 hours to get, um, to get there. So, that includes like taking a ferry, taking motorbike, taking like super long car rides, just to get there. So, it really puts things into perspective about, you know, people say it's that fires in Indonesia are hard to put out. And when you actually go on the ground, you can see the reality of that problem. So for Muiz, we visited his, his plantation. Uh, he, his own plantation was not affected by the fires in 2015, but his crop yield had definitely was affected um, and his harvest had uh, dropped a lot. So yeah, when we were there, they were also very hospitable. Like when, when Mark and I were like so tired, um, like, okay, I mean, like, just to put things in perspective, like we were traveling very long hours and stuff and he was very hospitable in that he even, like pluck coconuts from his from his tree and, and give it to us immediately and it was like one of the best meals that we had there. Yeah. So and we also met Octo. So Octo he works for an environmental group called Jikala Hari. Um, and they campaign on forest issues in Riau. And he is pictured here against a burnt landscape of acacia trees. So acacia is a is a tree that's often grown for the production of pulp and paper. And in this case, it was very, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a burnt landscape. So going across the Pacific Ocean, we also met uh, a farmer who worked in the Galapagos Highlands. So when you have too much rain in Galapagos, so in Indonesia, you, El Nino brings too little rain, which worsens the forest fires. But in the Galapagos, it's the opposite impact. You get too much rain, and that helps with the spread of invasive species uh, like blackberries, which are which are invasive on Galapagos. And as a farmer, he has seen how that has affected his own crop yield. And, and when birds eat, eat like the blackberries and spread their seeds, it just makes the problem worse. Yeah, so that is, um, yeah, that, 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 that are some of the personalities that we met um, over the course of our trip. Yeah, and thirdly, we had to, I'm sure many field scientists would be able to identify with the fact that you know things don't always go according to plan. So first thing was that my luggage got lost when the moment we arrived on the Galapagos Islands. And the Galapagos is an archipelago with the islands are very far apart from each other. So the moment we touched down, we met our fixer, we had to go immediately to another island, which is a two hour uh, speedboat right away. So I didn't really have time to wait around for my luggage. Um, and I just had to roll with it. So I ended up like buying touristy t-shirts, which I'm wearing one now, right, to commemorate this feature. And wearing um, some of Mark's clothes as well as um, just whatever I had in my hand carry bag at that time. So it was, it was an experience. And luckily, I packed all my important gear, like my notebook, my recorder, and my binoculars, everything with my hand carry. So lessons learned. And um, also because we had, we had to... Um, I think Mark will share more later, but during the course of our trip, because he was going back to Singapore and I was going back to the US, we had to get as much work as possible done we were together and it was easier to discuss rather than in Singapore and California, it was a 15-hour time difference. So after all our interviews, at the end of the day, we will get down to work, but sometimes the lights don't cooperate and, and like you had to improvise. So when we were on the Galapagos Islands, the, the light suddenly went out. But... Um, thanks to NTUC plastic bags, it, it, Mark was able to set up a temporary light that we could use to like reference our notes and stuff. Yeah, and so another challenge would be because in the Galapagos Islands, our focus was on the endemic animals there, which are severely affected by our Nino events. And our poster child is like my favorite animal, while at the Galapagos, the tropical penguin, the Galapagos penguin, the only penguin species that can be found near the equator. And this was so iconic because during El Nino events, the upwelling uh, and cool water gets cut off. And as a result, your penguin populations can fall by up to 80% during an El Nino event. So if, can you imagine, like, I'm sure you guys know better than me, but if it's endemic and found nowhere else in the world, there's no like, assurance populations elsewhere. And 80% is a huge figure. So I knew that we had to get shots of the Galapagos penguin. But this is not a zoo, right? We cannot guarantee sightings of wildlife. So as a result, everywhere we go, Mark had his camera out um, and he had to ensure that we stay at least two meters away from 
from the animals. This is like part of the Galapagos uh, National Park regulations. So thankfully, uh, and I guess Mark can elaborate more later, we, we went on like an impromptu field trip to one other island where, which we were not supposed to go because we heard that the peng there was a higher chance of us seeing these beautiful creatures there. And thankfully we did. Uh, it was actually quite far away where we took this, but Mark, maybe you can elaborate. Okay, so this picture um, we shot from the front of the boat, um, which was going through, uh, let's say, I think this was like 30 meters away. So I think one of the challenges is when we are reporting on an environment story, we also want to be endorsing the correct operators. So um, the operator, the boat operator that we went with, um, the tour that they ran, uh, we, we had researched it before because there are some times where, for example, uh, on the same day, on the same trip, there were people in the water jumping off from a boat which was clearly like, I would say 10 meters away from the penguins and obviously not abiding the by the Galapagos distance rules, right, of two meters. So um, we had done our research before and to, to um, properly find out whether these guys that we we're following were um, were following the rules. So in, in, in this scenario, right, just, just right left of this rock where I shot this penguin, there were people in the water with GoPros sticking their like, cameras in the penguin's faces. So that wasn't really nice. Um, yeah, so that was a lucky day for us. We managed to get the penguins. On the same day, we also went to, uh, so this, this island is called Isabella. So um, I think on, on that day, we managed to get quite a lot of good stuff visually. Like this image, I think for Audrey and I, kind of represents what the Galapagos is, where you have the very, very special blue-footed booby, which was two meters away, and uh, the arid landscape, which is very significant of the Galapagos. So, um, I mean, Back to like logistics and all that, right? Like, I think for this kind of story where we are traveling, let's say seven days within an archipelago, we had to kind of um, on the whim decide where we were, where we're gonna go based on budget and time constraints as well. So this last mini trip paid off, lah. So, I mean, some sometimes you get like kind of unexpected stuff as well. So. The other animal that we knew we wanted to get was the, the marine iguana. And I mean, in the perfect world, we would have wanted to catch it in the water with you know, an underwater GoPro or something. Like. So we, this was, I think, the last one or two days, we were on the beach trying to wait for, waiting near the water for uh, iguana sightings. Like. But we, we did manage to, to find one or two. So after, I think, an hour, we, we heard that this coast had uh, many big, marine iguana. So we walked for about an hour and a half down the coast and then we managed to get these right before the sunset. Yeah. Yeah, and okay, so I the, just wanna, like, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So like when 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 we were there, we were, we had to constantly de determine like what's gonna go in my story and whether Mark would have the correct visuals to accompany it. And so um when we were there, Mark keeps telling me, you know, context is very important. Context is very important. So, which is why, like, these two, all these shots, right, especially of the blue-footed booby against the arid background was, was so important in conveying the message that we wanted to say because our, our topic was on El Nino, right, and how it could have impacts that um, are very different from the status quo. So, in the Galapagos Island, um, the status quo is arid landscapes and this shows it perfectly because look at all the cactus in the background. It shows exactly the typical dry conditions that are in the Galapagos Islands. And the presence of the booby there was also perfect because the blue-footed booby is so closely associated with, with the islands. So yeah, so at that point when, when Mark took this shot and, and we looked at his footage at the end of the day, we were all like, okay, this is going to be like one of our main images. Yeah, so anyway, just to like sum up because Marcus is hiring me already. Um, so at the, after we got everything done, right, we had to piece the story together. And at this point, things would, I mean, I would have gone back to the US and Mark would be back in Singapore. So there was a lot of like WhatsApp voice notes because who got time to type out when you are in a rush. So eventually everything uh, went through and oh, we also had to fact check with the scientists. So sometimes this can be very tricky. And for this story, which was published over four pages, there was a lot of science. So there was a lot of things to fact check. You had to fact check the climate scientists to ensure the facts about El Nino were right. You had to fact check with the biologists to ensure that the facts on the different animals are right. And 
we covered so many different animals, so there were a lot of bio biologists to check with. So thankfully, um, everything panned out well, and I, it was also good that, that I was in the US and I was like focusing on my studies at that point, because then I had a bit more time to, to do research about everything perfectly. And yeah, this was the final outcome for pages. I mean, we would have appreciated more pages so that we could display the photos better. But uh, we also have a documentary that we pieced together. Uh, it's a 20 minute long documentary and I'll put the link at the end. Mm, but this is like how Mark, Mark also edited the own, his own video. So this is like how it looks. Yeah, this is just to show an example of how uh, long the documentary was, I guess. Cause like because of the time difference, um, we had to. We decided that before she would go back to US and before I go back to Singapore, uh, on the whole trip itself, we would edit on the go. So every day when we would come back, based on interviews and footage that we have got, uh, each day we would slot them in um, into the video accordingly, and she would work on a, on her article concurrently. So um, it was like our our repeated routine every day was. Because it was so expensive to eat out on our Galapagos, we, we would buy groceries for like a few days and then we would take turns transcribing interviews and so one would transcribe at night, one would cook. Then after we ate, we would both work on the script together. So this this happened for the whole trip throughout Indonesia and Galapagos and it, and it made things much easier for us. Lah. Yeah. So this is the... So Audrey will send the link for the full documentary in the, the chat, which is right here. Yeah, and I before we finish, I'm gonna show a video of uh, dancing boobies. Yeah, this is our like farewell present, <laughs> the mating dance of the blue-footed booby, which we captured very ethically from very far away. I hope, I hope we didn't like too much. Yeah, but anyway, so I guess we can start taking questions now. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, guys. Sorry, I was trying to find my uh, unmute button for a while. So there was an awkward silence. Thank you for the talk, Mark and Audrey. That was a really good talk and I enjoyed the pictures because I do some photography myself and I'm like looking at these pictures and I'm like very jealous as well. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I wish you know, I could get take pictures like that. So um, we have a bunch of questions for you guys. Um, so we'll just pick a couple and then we'll check whether Marcus has any questions. So yes, let's see from the top. Right, uh, Nazri wants to know, speaking of sen sensationalism, do you think current mainstream news reports with regard to STEM fields are often overhyped, sensationalized, or beaten to death? If yes, is there anything that could be done to reduce this in the future? Okay, so I guess, um, Nasri, do you mean like, you know, for example, now during COVID, then there's a lot of different kinds of reports about having a cure and something like that. Is that what you mean? Okay, but I'm just going to assume that that's how you mean, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, hi, uh, sorry. So uh, no, that's not really what I mean. I mean like more of in general. So like for example, the past few weeks uh, with animal, like the author thing, or like, yeah, even some of the COVID stuff is a bit overhyped. Mm. So it's like and sometimes the haze to... issues, yeah, like they make, it is a big problem, but sometimes they make it seem like a lot bigger than it actually is, I feel. Mm, okay. So, okay, let me just talk about things that I have covered. So, um, like sometimes, like say, okay, let's say COVID news, right? During, now, during this period when basically the entire nation is on like pandemic mode, um, it could, sometimes our editors would just request for certain stories because we know that that's what the public wants. And surprisingly, even though like in certain fields that you would think that, oh, there's too much coverage of a certain thing, for the people not in the field, they actually do email, um, reporters a lot. So let me just give you an example, like um, during the COVID thing, we had some stay at home notice in hotels and stuff, right? 
So there was, I had, I re- had written a couple of stories on that. But after that, I got a lot of other emails from people or from people wanting to know more about the stay-at-home notice, whether they would be eligible and all that. So I think sometimes it depends on, on the national interest at that point and what the readers are signaling that they want to know more of. Yeah, and things like Hayes, it would be probably because at that point, like the PSI was climbing up or people could see the haze. Sometimes I would also say that, you know, we don't really need to do so much stories about a particular thing, but, but sometimes it's, it's not up to us. And yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Audrey. Uh, the next question is uh, from Sinway. He wants to know, um, he's got two questions. I'm, uh, I'm just going to pick one of it because you know uh, time uh, does writing still have a future alongside newer forms of media like infographics podcasts and videos oh i'm glad you asked okay so i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna think about our new podcast series on environmental issues called green pulse um, which was started by the Straits times about 2018 yeah and i think a lot of people in this in this zoom room has has been interviewed on, on our podcast series before. And I do feel that writing still has an important role um, as well. But that's not to say one is more important than the other. I feel that now in this... Uh, just to check, can everyone and anyone else hear Audrey? Or is it just me? No, I also can't hear Audrey. I think she, she yeah, lost connection. Her. Yeah, I think she lost connection. Uh, we will just wait a while while she ask, tries ask to fix the question. Yeah, okay. I think I was, yeah. was going to do that. I'm just going <laughs> to go through. I think there was yeah. one question for you, Mark. Um, let's see. I think it was Siva's question it? as well. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. So, hi, Mark. I from from Siva. I appreciate your ethical approach to nature photography. Uh, do newspapers or journalism associations suggest such guidelines or do you find you have to educate bosses about such an approach? Okay, so for this case, we were never given a kind of a directive. Lah. But, so it's up to us to kind of um, come up with that ourselves. So I, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say that a lot of other people from other organizations or whatever do that, but for us, we try to, you know, use our, our common sense and our empathy lah, because we, it's kind of like, a, maybe bosses don't know as well, like they don't know uh, what are the rules or how close you're going to be. Obviously, everyone wants to see a closer photo like what you see, like in, in NetGeo or, or something like that, right? But we don't have that kind of equipment. So whatever it is, we, we try to work within those means, but we still, um, consciously abide by those rules lah. Yeah. Oh, th- thank you, Mark, okay, for yeah. that. Uh, yeah. oh, Audrey is back. Hello, Audrey. The rain knocked out my internet. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, do you want to carry on from where you left off about um, the podcast? And oh, how yeah. you, so... you have featured most of us on it? <laughs> so, I mean, other than podcasts, we have, uh, we also try other means of telling stories, which is why for, for this particular El Nino feature, Mark and I, um, we, did, we, did the, we did a video and we also did a podcast with um, one of the scientific directors of the El Nino Research Center in Ecuador. So, it is still on our, it is still online. So, yeah, I think, you know, you've got to just tackle, catch the audience from every angle possible. Okay, fair enough. Uh, speaking of catching people, um, there was another question here. Uh, how do you pick your field interviewees on the ground? Is it opportunistic or are your fixers critical for that? Mm, it depends, I think. I don't know, Mark, do you want to say anything? Uh, well, I, I guess it kind, it kind of is it's very planned, but like for example, our, our Indonesian story, um, Muklis, the uh, journalist we managed to interview was was really uh, something of, uh, which happened by chance because we were supposed to interview, I think a military guy or someone in the government first, but because he did not turn up or did not answer, then our fixer gave us another contact um, who happened to be Muklis, who yeah, happened to think, yeah. Yeah, who happened to kind of be one of the main anchors of the Indonesian story. So 
So, you know, I, I won't rule out like getting lucky and doing things by chance, but it really is by a lot of it is also uh, making use of the situation that you have like, and talking to people around you and uh, not just depending on your contacts or your appointments. Yeah, um, so for like what Mark said, the interview with Mukles was very serendipitous because he was not actually in our original list of interviewees. And we only heard, we only managed to get in touch with him because we overheard our fixer talking about this guy. And then upon further probing, he told us the story. And, and we asked, like, you know, would, would he be willing to talk to us? And eventually, yes, and we went down. Um, other interviewees that we chose, uh, yeah, so... For example, we always try to strike a balance. So especially for things like um, El Nino and the forest fires in Indonesia, right? It can be quite tricky, right? So like you cannot just have one voice from an environmental group. Uh, that's why we try to tell the stories of actual people whose actual like livelihoods are affected by El Nino so that, that there's multiple voices on, on one issue. Yeah, and... For the Galapagos Islands, we did have to rely on our fixer a lot to get in touch um, with interviewees. And that was also because of a language barrier. In Ecuador, they speak Spanish. And at that point, um, both of us didn't know how to speak Spanish. And even our conversations with the Galapagos Marine um, National Park authorities, I had to use Google Translate because all their emails to me were in Spanish. But thankfully, everything worked out uh, in the end. And of course, when you go for these kind of assignments, you, you would have people who can recommend people who you talk to, but it's also important to just walk around and see what you can get. And sometimes people on the streets that you meet will have very interesting stories to tell you too, even though they are not like part of your official um, interview list or part of the pe uh, a person that you set out to interview in the first place. Okay. So I guess it's kind of a, a mix of planning and chance as well. And you guys just find like the sweet spot to work together, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Uh, last question. Uh, it's it's one question, but I'm going to split it to both of you, right? As people in the back line, right? So I think this would uh, be good. What environmental news articles do you all see being most viewed or shared by Singaporeans? So uh, Mark can go first. Uh, what environmental news or articles do you all see being most viewed or shared by Singaporeans? Uh, this is from uh, Samuel. I mean, right now, I would think... Besides, I mean, besides COVID, it'll probably be, like, people love the author stuff. So, uh, authors are very, very popular to be, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the news sharing circle, uh, I would say authors at the moment, yeah, besides, besides COVID stuff, yeah. Audrey, for you, eh? So, I've, re I've been reporting on environmental issues since, like, 2013, and... It's very unpredictable, really. So sometimes you, I would write a story and think, wow, this one confirm a lot of people read. But then in the end, the figure show me no. And then there's another story that I write, I would think that, okay, maybe not many people will read. But then it turns out to be like super shared a lot. So it's very hard to predict. And and I guess it's also good because then it just like keeps me on my toes, right? I write about every single animal around. And I think I have done that. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes I would feel that, you know, how, how this actually pays off it's not really in terms of how many people share it, but it's about the things that people tell me or like the comments that I see on Facebook. So for example, I remember I wrote a story on corals in Singapore and one of the comments that, I, that still stick with me today, I think I wrote it like in the early stages of my career, was that, oh, I didn't know that there were corals in Singapore. So it's nice to know. So that's one. Then for example, um, recently I wrote, yesterday, or a story I wrote about like bird calls in Singapore was published. And then I, I will have people telling me that, oh, thank you for telling me that, that. Thanks for telling me about this. Now I know what is it that I heard and like, I love it so much. So it's like all these small, small like seeds I feel that really makes me feel like, like the work that we do has an impact rather than like whether or not a story does very well. Because, you know, you know, environmental awareness is an incremental thing. It's not like today I write a story and the next day everyone will start being aware of the environment. I mean, to me as a journalist, I feel that what keeps me going is People only start to care about what they know. And if they don't even know that there's so much beauty all around us, even in urban Singapore, why would they even um, start to be interested? So, yeah, I guess, I hope that answers the question. Right, thank you very much, uh, Mark and Audrey, for uh, telling us about your work as well as answering our questions from um, the STEM community. So, uh, we don't have uh, much time for a final question, but I'm just going to plug the... Uh, 
uh, Straits Times uh, website on in the chat room. So if you are interested to read more about their stories or see their pictures, uh, the links are below. And uh, maybe if, uh, if you have people are interested, they can might stay behind and ask more questions. Uh, I know Audrey might be around, and but Buck may have to go for uh, a dinner. Right. So, uh, if you're interested, maybe uh, if Audrey can stay behind, you, would you be staying behind? Okay. All right. So we'll see uh, if, if people are staying it. But uh, could everyone please uh, join me in thanking um, all of them? I'm going to unmute you uh, for a moment and please uh, join me in thank and, uh, thanking our speakers. Thank you. 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 All right, I am going to um, mute everyone right now again. Uh, so. All right, so uh, we are moving on to this, our trivia right now. So um, Kanan will be sharing the screen and I'm gonna give a quick briefing about the rules. Um, so today's trivia, or typical trivia, has four rounds, three, three standard rounds, get five questions each, then get five points each, uh, and then there is one bonus round at the end. So how this works is that, please fill in, if you're playing the trivia, please uh, fill in the trivia sheet, it's tinyurl.com slash sgstem-trivia. So, uh, please fill in your team name as well as your beneficiary. If you win, you get to choose uh, which environmental NGO or charity gets to benefit from the trivia pot. Right. So today's theme is MOM. Kanan will tell you more about it later. But for the trivia, uh, you can play alone or you can play as a team, uh, up to five people. And uh, there'll be an honor code, no checking or looking up our answers on Google or encyclopedias anywhere, uh, but you can ask uh, people from your team. Uh, at the end, we request that you take a photo or email your answers to us with your team name uh, to sgstem uh, talk trivia at gmail.com with flashes again so that we can check your answers. Right. So um, over to Kanan. Please fill in the uh, spreadsheet as we before we begin. Yeah. So you guys can just go start filling it in. I will give you guys. One more minute, and uh, we will go on. But obviously, for MOM, it uh, you guys will find out what it is shortly. I think a few of you have seen it because I have uh, rather chunky fingers, and I just uh, hit it earlier. So yep, I can see Audrey trying to think really hard what MOM is. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think uh, everyone has more or less signed in. Marcus, may I start? Oh, people are asking whether it's view only. Unfortunately, um, it's not. It's the main sheet trivia, and I see it being uh, filled up quite a lot already. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Give me a moment. Okay. Uh, so sorry. So I thought I changed the trivia sheet already at the start, but somehow it it reverted to the old, old, um, old sheet. So I'm going to clear it. And so we start from Nasiria. I have no idea how come this happened. It was fine at the start of the talk. Um, and I'm going to copy everybody's information from the spreadsheet. So, okay. So I think we are, as people fill this up, we okay. Can begin in a minute or two. Can do. I can always come back to this shit anyways, and this thing will be in the chat. So yeah. So let's go. Yeah. I think M someone is, can do or something. Okay. Yeah. The first uh, is math. So you won't need a calculator for this. I hope. So let's go. If you were to spell out all of the numbers from one to a thousand, how many times would you encounter the letter A? If you were to spell out all the numbers from one from zero to a thousand, even zero to a thousand, not one, zero to a thousand, how many times would you encounter the letter A? Happy spelling. Okay, moving on. It's a true or false question. 
Harvard University was founded before calculus was invented. Harvard University was founded before calculus was invented. True or false? So I'm just going to go through the questions quite quickly. If you guys need it, you all know, just shout me in the chat and I'll go back to it. Question three, who invented the number zero? Who invented the number zero? A, Brahmagupta, C, Lee Chun Feng, no, B, Lee Chun Feng, C, Severus Sebok, D, Stephanus of Alexandria. A, Brahmagupta, B, Lee Chun Feng, C, Severus Sebok, D, Stephanus of Alexandria. Which of the following people invented the number zero? Four, what is an angle which is more than 90 degrees and less than 180 degrees called? What do you call an angle that is more than 90 but less than 180 degrees? And question five, the name of Elon Musk's and Grimes' child, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, includes the Roman numerals XII, which represents 12. Of the seven Roman numeral symbols used in use today, what does L represent? Of the seven I'm Roman gonna... Sorry, Marcus. I'm going to attempt to pronounce it according to what Elon Musk says. It, it means okay, uh, X Ash A12. X Ash A12. So the question is of the seven Roman numeral symbols in use today, what does L represent? So A5, B50, C500, D5000. All right. And uh, we can move on. O stands for ocean, which ties in uh, quite well with the talk today. So let's see what ocean has in store for us. Of the five oceans on Earth, the Pacific is the largest, which is number two. Of the five oceans, the Pacific is the largest, which is the second largest ocean. How? Oh. Singapore experiences semi diurnal tide. How many high and low tides does it experience in a 24 hour day? How many high and low tides does Singapore experience in a 24 hour day? And uh, moving on to question three. What is the typical freezing point of seawater. What is the typical freezing point of seawater? So the question is, do you combine the high and low tides? Yes, you do. So how many high tides, how many low tides, how many sets of high tides and how many sets of low tides there? In a single day. Um, moving on. Uh, okay. What is the expansion of scuba in scuba diving, scuba tank, scuba kit? I've helped you out for this one, so y'all don't hit me so much, and I've given you the U, which is underwater. What is the expansion of scuba in scuba diving? Yes, for all of you who didn't know this, scuba is actually an abbreviation uh, or an acronym. So, yeah, what does scuba stand for? Blank, blank, underwater, blank, blank. Of course, I had to give you guys underwater because you know, that was the most obvious one. So, yeah. <laughs> and moving on. Oh, yes. Love cartoons. In the SpongeBob SquarePants series, the titular character, SpongeBob, his town has an underwater beach destination called Goo Lagoon. Does this underwater water body phenomenon exist in real life? 
do underwater water bodies exist in real life as they do on SpongeBob Town? Uh, yes, you have to answer yes or no for this. So you guys just got to say yes or no. Or you can put true if you want to put false as well. So yes or no, true or false, yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to the last M, or the second M even, marine biology. Yes, so people who are doing marine stuff and ocean stuff, you'll probably be like really happy with the quiz today. So let's see what does marine biology hold. A, A, one. What marine organism has blue colored blood, three hearts, and a donut shaped brain that wraps around, if it's, wraps around its esophagus? What marine organism has blue blood, three hearts, and a donut shaped brain that wraps around its esophagus? Moving on, if I ask you to prepare a dish with Bombay duck, what marine organism do you need? A, a geoduck, B, a species of fish, C, a species of marine or sea duck or seal. If I ask you to prepare a dish with Bombay duck, what marine organism do you need? Geoduck, species of fish, species of marine or sea duck or a type of seal. And moving on, what is the first animal described from Singapore thought to be extinct for more than 100 years and then rediscovered in Singapore in 2011? What is the first animal described from Singapore thought to be extinct for more than 100 years and then rediscovered in Singapore in 2011? Moving on, blank, uh -huh, another SpongeBob. Blank are the only flowering plants that grow in the marine environment. Blank are the only flowering plants that grow in the marine environment. What is blank? Sinway, you better not be referring to the book. Or any of you for the matter. And I know I don't have obsession as much about at all. Five, which of the following following are obligate marine organisms? Obligate meaning they can be only found in marine environments or seawater. Which of the following are obligate marine organisms? A, urchins, B, jellyfish, C, flatworms, D, sponges. Urchins, jellyfish, flatworms, sponges. Which of the following are obligate marine organisms? Yeah, um, yeah, you can refer to them as sea urchins or sea jellies. Flatworms are also known as flatty helminths, I think. And then you get sponges. Uh, Ivan wants to repeat question one. Why not? There we go. Blue blood, three hearts, donut brain around its throat. What animal am I talking about? Okay. And uh, yep, yeah, I know some people say jellyfish, some people say sea jellies, like how we have starfish and sea stars. All right. We didn't want to um, bias the, the options by putting up the word C not in the options. Yeah, that is true. So now it's all vague and ambiguous. Have now, we gone through the question on the underwater plan? Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, let's moving on to answers. I'm just going to quickly check the chat if anyone needs help. No. All right. Moving on to answers. Fast game, everyone. Fast game. If you were to spell out the numbers from zero to a thousand, you would encounter the letter A only once. And that is in thousand. 
A appears for the first time in thousand T H O U S A N D. Yes, that was the right spelling. I just checked my spelling as well, so yeah. Question two. Yes, Harvard was founded before calculus was invented. It was a couple of decades as well, I think. Not too much, but a couple of decades uh, before calculus was invented and then brought to Harvard. So true, Harvard is older than calculus. And zero was invented by Brahmagupta. He was a mathematician from India. Uh, the rest of the people on the list are also mathematicians from the seventh century. Uh, if you have an angle that is more than 90 degrees and less than 180, it's called an obtuse angle. If you're under 90 degrees, you're acute angle. I mean, it is an acute angle. Uh, five, the name of the child, oh, that's not, that's not in the question at all. L represents 50. L represents 50. Marcus, say the name again. XSA12. Excellent. Uh, carrying on, ocean. Uh, the Atlantic is the second largest ocean, with the Pacific being the first. And uh, the other oceans are the Indian, the Arctic, and the Southern. And Singapore experiences two high and two low tides in a 24-hour day. Two high tides and two low tides in a, sing in a Singapore hour day? In a 24-hour day. And the typical freezing point of seawater is negative two degrees Celsius. Negative two degrees Celsius or minus two degrees Celsius is the typical freezing point of seawater. Question four, SCUBA stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. Uh, another similar daily use acronym is LASER, which stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation, LASER. These are only two I know. There's apparently a bunch of them. So stuff like NASA as well, you know, things you can say as a word. Uh, they call it an acronym. Sonar and radar as well. Yes, sonar and radar as well. Question five. Uh, yes, you do get underwater water bodies. They are called brine pools and they have a salinity level that is three to eight times greater than the surrounding oceans. And unlike in SpongeBob, uh, the real life brine pools are toxic to marine animals. So you won't see them surfing or having fun in it or laughing. Marine biology answers. We are looking at an octopus. Octopus have blue blood because they have copper as their base, uh, a copper-based blood system, and they got three hearts and a donut-shaped brain that's wrapped around this esophagus, which means a really big meal will cause brain damage. Same. Two, if uh, you're looking for Bombay duck, you're looking for a species, species? A species of lizard fish. Uh, that's not too sure why this name came about. Some people say it's because the fish was transported by uh, train across uh, India during the colonial times. And uh, according to Robert Clive, uh, apparently the fish smelled like parcels and goods that came from Bombay. So yeah, but it's got something to do with trains and uh, the way things were transported in the good old days. Question three, uh, the first animal described from Singapore thought to be extinct for more than a hundred years and then rediscovered in Singapore in 2011 is the Neptune's, Neptune's cup sponge. The Neptune cups sponge. And I'm gonna plug the book that Sinway talked about. So the Deculture Natural History Museum um, recently released an ebook, a free ebook, which is called 20, 200 points in Singapore's natural history. You can download it for free at the link. Lots of information there. Yep. And very likely future questions will come from this. So you guys better be revising. We will know. Question four, sea grasses are the only flowering plants that, glow, that grow in the marine environment. Sea grasses are the only flowering plants that grow in the marine environment. So if you're a mermaid and you needed flowers, that's where you need to go. 
five, urchins are the only obligate marine organisms. Urchins are the only ones on this list who can be found only in seawater and not in freshwater. Of course, you get freshwater jellies, you get uh, flatworms in freshwater on land, and um, you get sponges in freshwater. And fun fact, right? Urchins or the antiphylum, echinoderms, are the only ones that have no freshwater or terrestrial representatives. And uh, mm -hmm. let's move on to the bonus round. So I'm going to explain the, the rules really quickly. So could you please tally up all your scores and put it onto the spreadsheet? And I'm just going to make a total uh, sum here so you guys don't have to add it. Um, and what happens in a bonus round is that there is one question where uh, you can wager. So you can wager from one point all the way to the number, total number of points you have. So let's say you've got full marks for all of them. You've got 15 points. You can wager one point to 15 points. And if you get the bonus question correct, you gain the number of points you wager. And if you get the bonus question wrong, you lose the number of points that uh, you wager. So if you've got 15 points, you wager five points. If you got it correct, the bonus question correct, you get 20 points in total. But if you get it wrong, you take 15 minus 5, you get 10 points, right? So please put all your wages onto uh, the, the spreadsheet, and then we can start playing. Yep. When you are good to go, we will go, Marcus. I think the active teams, uh, two teams are still filling up their wages, and one team have a, this is a chance to fill up your team name and beneficiary as well. Right, so a, there's a mix of A L L S Y C A, uh, which is the Singapore Youth Climate uh, Action, right? Um, J G I S W W F. So who will win this time? Oh, by the way, do we have any any cool team names? Was there any um, pandering to either of us? No, there is a new one. It's uh, Slow Robbie's ninety eight. Um, I think Kai is a new player. Uh, Belina as well. All right. So I think okay. almost all teams, uh, LL and One Half, please fill in your wages. And oh, I think they're still, they're still totaling their scores. Okay. We'll, we'll give them a minute. Yeah, we can give them like a couple of seconds more. Yep. Oh, and, and remember, guys, only wager what you got. Okay. I think we can, um, we can ask the bonus question now, now that the wages all right. are up. Bonus round, which comes from the talk, the talk done by Audrey and Marcus. Marcus? Mark, sorry. Mark. Yeah, what kind of boobies did Mark and Audrey see and feature from the Galapagos Islands? What kind of boobies did Mark and Audrey see and feature from the Galapagos Islands? Oh, Audrey said so easy. <laughs> That's because you're the one that gives the talk. So uh, Ivan is trash talking. What do you yeah. believe him? Yeah, Ivan, stop giving you the answers. Come on. All right. So um, please write down your answers. We will yeah. get to the answers in a bit. Everyone is uh, putting the answers yeah, in man. the chat. Okay, so uh, everyone is ready. Um, yeah. All right, let's yeah. roll. And what the answers. They saw, oh, ooh, there we go. Blue footed boobies. Mark and Audrey saw blue footed boobies in the Galapagos Islands. And they also featured a nice dancing video of them towards the end. Yeah, so, I think they mentioned it at least two or three times. Yep. So, uh, Yep, so if you got uh, answers correct, please add your wager to your total. If you got your, the bonus question wrong, please subtract your wager from your total and update the spreadsheet and we would give um, the unofficial winning team and uh, announce that in a bit and then we will check the answers and put the official winner on our website. Yep, and uh, while Marcus is uh, telling the scores, I think I'll do a quick one and just tell uh, them about next week's, next week's, not next week's, the next event. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, please uh, submit your your answers to us by email. You could take a photo of it if you would put it on paper, 
or you could, if, if you type it up, please send it to us via email. So emails on the screen as well. Um, and if you haven't already contributed to the trivia part, if you're thinking about it, um, you could do so too. Yep. And for those people who are wondering about the emails, right? So what happens is now Marcus will just look through the list and it will give the unofficial winner. And once the session is done, we'll go through and look at all the answers. And just to be sure that the unofficial winner is the official winner. So far, we never had any issues. Like there wasn't like a different official winner later. So far, it's all been fine. But no, we just want to do a check. Just to be sure. Okay. And it looks like um, we've got a tie again for Ooh. our uh, yep, uh, anonymous Malayan water monitor. That's his uh, second time winning. Mm -hmm. And Nazri, uh, who is his third time winning, won as part of a team last week and then second time as, his, uh, as an individual. So, but since they both uh, chose Acres as their beneficiary, so there is no uh, tiebreaker that's needed. Um, okay. So, congratulations to you guys. Um, Belina, you need to let us know your grand total. We could just fill it in once we get your answer. So, thanks very much for playing. Um, Kanan will tell us about our next speaker. Yeah, um, and also, I, yeah, I also I want to say, like, I'm waiting for someone to have a tie and have two different beneficiaries so I can bring in some really difficult tiebreaker questions. But you guys have been playing safe so far. So, but yeah, congrats to both the winners, Anonymous Water Monitor and to Nazri. Congrats on your multiple wins as well. So, uh, let's go to next week's, not next week. That, that's the thing, right? The talk is not next week. It is next next week because as of post circuit breaker we are making our talks every two weeks so the next one is on the 18th of june and the following one will be the second of july so for the 18th of june we have debbie and debbie is going to be talking to us about dogs demography and disease and she's gonna discuss her findings on how uh, she did her work on in the himalayas and how it became the nation's first community wildlife disease monitoring program so I don't know whether there'll be pictures of red pandas there, but I'm hoping there will be pictures of red pandas. So yeah, so that is on the 18th of June, same time, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. As usual, there will be a trivia, right? And for those of you who didn't know, uh, we also have our website and we have a Facebook page as well. And all these talks get recorded and get put on our website and on YouTube. So there's many ways for you guys to connect with us. So yeah. Science communication is based on connection, so connect with us and connect with the speakers as well because we will drop you their Twitter handles and stuff like that. Marcus? Yep, so thanks for joining us, uh, even though it's a strange timing for all of us again. Uh, so if you have any uh, questions, you might want to stay behind or put your questions in the chat box and I think Audrey is still around and she might be able to answer them. Um, and so maybe one more plug for uh, Debbie. Debbie is a Net Geo Explorer, uh, one of Singapore's few Net Geo Explorers. And she is also the uh, uh, founder of um, Hantu Blog, uh, where they, she used to lead, I think they still do, people uh, scuba diving in the southern island of Singapore. And she's, she also started this program when she realized that um, dots may transmit diseases to wildlife. Uh, so she'll tell us more about it. And uh, She's also, uh, you can find her on Twitter. So uh, if you are interested in asking any questions, stay behind. And we also want to take a, 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 a Wi-Fi as usual. So turn on your cameras and uh, we'll take will, a photo. Yeah, let me just stop screen sharing. Uh -huh, there we are, done. So yes, you guys can just pop your cameras on and appear and flash us some smiles. 